So the last couple of years have sort of been years of flux, haven't they? I mean, we have watched the U.S. economy bounce back and forth. We have watched um, virus statistics go up and down. But in that time, we've discovered that many folks have been paring down on non-essentials, rediscovering what's really important. So online auction, classified advertising sites such as eBay and Craigslist, they are full of items for sale. Stuff that folks figure they can part with in order to snag a few extra bucks or just to simplify, simplify their lives. Well, our flea market is full and overflowing as people continue to give things away to simplify and help those who are in our community through tough times. And that begs a question. Are there some things that you would never sell or give away under any circumstances? I mean, if your situation became so dire that you were between rock bottom and a very hard decision, what would you absolutely hold on to, regardless of the cost? Of course, we aren't talking about just material things here, precious family mementos, family possessions, and the like. In a fallen world, where daily people are dehumanized into commodities, a lot more than great grandma's wedding ring can be at stake. Selling your children, for example, is reprehensible to everybody here in this room, and yet that happens in certain places around the world. Selling one's own body has historically been a response to bad economic conditions which is why prostitution is known as the oldest profession. And in many places around the world, the sex trade sells people, many of them children, into slavery on a daily basis. We discovered here in the United States not so very long ago that the Super Bowl was one of the highest sex trade venues in the world. Selling illegal drugs puts people at risk of the slavery of addiction. You see, when human life is given a dollar value and judged by that, then we discover virtually nothing is off the table. Now, I'm pretty sure that all of us here can agree that some things should just never be for sale. Integrity, for example, or Freedom or love should never have a price tag, and neither should one's physical body. And you can probably think of quite a few additional things that should never go on the market. In the ancient world, one item incorporated not only material things, but a person's identity and a whole lot more, the birthright. Sell that and you would have sold out completely. Now, the birthright was a special privilege given to the firstborn male of any family. Do we have any firstborn males here today? Okay, quite a few. The birthright's economic value was, depending on your father's prosperity, often enough to set that firstborn son up for life. At his father's death, the eldest son received a double portion of the inheritance, or double what his brothers would get. The inheritance wasn't just economic, however. Uh, we know that the currency those days would have been primarily flocks and herds and slaves. It was also about leadership. Having the birthright meant exercising leadership over the family, replacing the family as the patriarch. And the holder of the birthright made the decisions, ruled over his brothers, and the family line would continue through him. In short, the birthright was designed to ensure the future of the family. So sell it, and you've, in essence, sold away the future. 
Which brings us into this part of our Genesis story, the birth of Esau and Jacob. It doesn't take long when you read this part of the story to notice that this whole thing is going to be about Jacob. It's also the story about an extremely dysfunctional family. There is lots of lying and cheating and manipulating and a whole lot more. These brothers we discover from our reading are in conflict beginning in the womb. And it continues throughout their lives. The boys couldn't be more different. Rebecca, their mother, um, had already been wrestling with the turmoil between them within her womb when she went to inquire of the Lord about her pain of having twins. Now, I don't know very many women who have given birth who haven't at some time gone to God and said, what did I get myself into? <laughs> um, but God tells her that the two boys who are struggling within her would eventually become two nations, and they would come to embody the struggle between them, Israel and Edom. And yet their roles would soon be reversed. The one shall be stronger than the other, God said, and the elder shall serve the younger. As a firstborn child, that always sort of gets my craw. Anyone else kind of go, mm, not quite fair. And we're not sure if that's why Jacob, the younger, ended up being Rebecca's favorite. But later on in the story, when you read deeper into it, you'll discover that she is more than glad to help this particular prediction come true. And we also don't know if Jacob knew about that conversation between God and Rebecca on that day when he was cooking the stew. But it's pretty clear that he was already working on a deal to take advantage of his strong but clueless and impulsive older brother. We read that Esau was famished when he came in from the field. He saw his circumstance as being absolutely desperate, thinking he was about to die. Now, I've been that hungry. Anyone else? I mean, you know, you are absolutely, your stomach is rumbling, your glands are salivating. You just feel like if you don't have something to eat right then, um, you just, you are going to die. Now, I'm not talking about those of you with low blood sugar or high blood sugar where that could be true. I'm talking about the rest of us. Um, because it would seem hard to believe that Esau was bad enough off to do what he ended up doing. But when circumstances are uncomfortable, we do have a tendency to exaggerate the effects of what's causing pain. And we will do anything to alleviate that pain, whether it's real or imagined. And those with high anxiety usually also have poor impulse control and thus rely on instant gratification to take away their pain, if only for a moment. That leads to a sort of all or nothing way of thinking that amplifies even the smallest inconvenience into a life or death crisis. And Jacob, Jacob times this perfectly. You can almost see him pausing long enough to let the aroma of the stew make Esau just a little bit crazier. I'll be glad to give you some of this red stuff, Jacob says. But first, you'll need to sell me your birthright. Now, Jacob knows the value of a bowl of stew and the value of one's whole economic, social, and familiar structure aren't equal. But he also knows his brother. And he knows that Esau, blinded as he always is by anxiety, doesn't see it that way. Esau is willing to mortgage everything he could possibly become simply to have a taste of that stew that he had probably had many times before. His stomach rules over his brain and he sells his future for practically nothing. Jacob even gives him a minute to think about it. He asks Esau to swear to the deal. So Esau figuratively 
signs on the dotted line and eats perhaps the most expensive bowl of stew in human history. Their back and forth bickering from this selling of the birthright to Jacob in today's text to a later on story where Jacob also steals the firstborn blessing, this story in its entirety reflects the enmity between the nations of Israel and Edom throughout their history. And their feuding reaches ahead when Esau threatens to kill Jacob and with his mother's help, Jacob hightails it out of there. And in his anger at not being able to deal with this brother of his, Esau marries one of the dreaded Canaanite women, punctuating his total fall from grace in his family. And that's when the story of Jacob truly begins. On his way to his uncle Laban's house, he stops to rest. And we have this wonderful story that we call the story of Jacob's ladder, a dream where he dreams of angels going up and down a ladder to God, and God blesses them all with the promise of Abraham's blessing, that he will, his will be the line through whom the world will be blessed. When he reaches his uncle Laban's house, his ultimate destination, he meets Rachel. Now, we all need to sigh. His cousin, he falls head over heels. She has promised to him in exchange for seven years of labor. And what seven years when you're in love? But surprise, surprise, on his wedding night, he discovers that a trade has been made. And he's married Rachel's older sister, Leah. Now, one might think that was a few just desserts for this trickster Jacob. But poor Leah. But another seven years of labor it is, and Rachel becomes his as well. And then a new bone of contention begins. Which of them will produce the most heirs? Well, Leah is quite fertile. She produces seven children. Rachel is infertile and in jealousy, offers her maid to Jacob, who produces two children. Then Leah, not to be outdone, offers her maid, and, well, you get the picture. Years later, there are 12 sons, two of them Rachel's, including Joseph, who will become the next central figure in our story. Rachel dies giving birth to his younger brother, Benjamin. And at that point, Jacob decides that it's finally time to confront Esau and return home. To his family. Then there's this sort of bizarre story that involves some sort of trickery involving animals, which involves some sort of um, magical mating ritual of some kind when Jacob takes fresh shoots from poplar, almond, and plain, and he peels them to create stripes. The ancient theory went when the animals looked at the striped branches, they would produce striped babies. Anyway, after all this happens, Laban gets a little bit suspicious because Jacob's flocks are growing and Laban's flocks are shrinking. And so Jacob does what Jacob does so well. He runs away. He's chased by Laban and accused of stealing his household gods, which unbeknownst to Jacob have been stolen by his beloved Rachel. Yes, evidently, Jacob has married into a family that worships foreign idols. Remember, we are reading the story that has been written for the people of the exile to give them an identity. So this is a reflection, once again, of Israel's mingling with foreign gods throughout its history. And yet, we find God hanging in there with God's people, no matter what. It's God who is always faithful, not Israel. And that story we read over and over and over again. So here we have Jacob, who has arrived in Haran, a single man on the run, who leaves Haran wealthy and the father of what will become the 12 tribes of Israel. Things are looking pretty good for Jacob. 
But in his heart, he knows that there is this time when if he's going to claim his birthright, he is going to have to have this inevitable reunion with his brother Esau. So as the family heads back into home territory, Jacob gets word that Esau is heading out to meet him with 400 armed men. Is this going to be a reunion or a battle? At that point, it doesn't look so good for Jacob. So ever the manipulative one, Jacob begins scheming, including a prayer to God to save him. And he sets off his brothers, strategically placing his family, you know which part of his family he loves more than others when you read that part, in case the worst scenario happens and it ends up being a battle. And on his way to meet Esau, he has probably one of the most bizarre encounters in the entire book of Genesis. He has an all-night wrestling match with a man who turns out to be an angel who disables Jacob by touching his hip socket and dislocating it so that Jacob forever walks with a limp. In that struggle, Jacob requests a blessing from the man, and in that blessing, his name is changed from Jacob to Israel, which means he strives with God. And that has been the ongoing story of Israel, a nation struggling and striving and wrestling with God. You see, even exile can't dissuade them from holding on to God so that God will continue to bless them according to God's promise. In Jacob's case at that particular time, his struggle prepares him for his confrontation with Esau, and he courageously meets his brother face to face, bowing to him seven times, which is an ancient way of total submission. And we get that, don't we? Don't we do that every time we know that we have offended someone and we want to make amends? And what does Esau do? Does anyone remember? He gives Jacob a great big hug. And Jacob, in return, sort of returns the blessing of being family when he comes back and he's reunited with his brother Esau. And they come together eventually to bury their father, Isaac. It's quite a story. Selling out, running away, deception, trickery, manipulation, questioning, eventually making amends. It's also a reminder to us that one impulsive decision made amid an anxious circumstance can truly have devastating ramifications for the future. And there are a lot of examples of how that story gets repeated throughout history and in our own communities. We've all heard about the respected leader who sells away his or her career and family for the momentary pleasure, perhaps, of an illicit affair. Or the business person who compromises his or her integrity by pocketing huge profits at the expense of fair wages and treatment of company employees. The teenager who wrecks his or her future by dabbling in drugs because it's just, just this one time. Or the driver who takes a wheel after an evening of drinking and takes a life in a crash. Those are just a few examples. Every single one of us could think of a whole lot more. But it's really important in the midst of those times when we make poor and impulsive decisions to remember that if we see ourselves as valued by God and blessed by God, no matter what mistakes, we have made or will yet make, then we have inherent value regardless of what we own or what our circumstances might be. Despite their colorful history 
their deception, their unfaithfulness, God continues to love Israel. And God continues to love us. So perhaps at this moment, it's important to ask, is there someone with whom you need to make amends? Or a deception that you need to undo? Maybe it's just the simple change of attitude that will help you move into a more contented future. I pray that each one of us will take some time this week to take stock of our own situation, to recognize that indeed our whole lives are, as the choir so beautifully sang, a quilt pieced together that truly is a handiwork of God when we give it over to God. But we too need to do what needs to be done in order, order for us to receive God's blessings. Amen.